Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the mining podcast. And today's guest is Mark Bowalter, who's an experienced mine engineer and business owner with over a business owner, sorry, with over 30 years industry experience in Australia, uh, working, working with some of the majors um, and having some directorships and ownerships of companies during his career. Um, Mark has recently written a book, a free book, um, called Crimes Against Mine Planning. So I thought it'd be good to have, uh, obviously, Mark on the show to tell us a little bit more about the book and why he thinks mine planning is a broken model um, and what maybe could be used instead. So that's welcome, Mark, to the podcast. How are you doing, Mark? Uh, excellent. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, good. Uh, good. Um, appreciate your time as well uh, in obviously doing this uh, podcast. Um, so for those that don't know you, obviously, this podcast goes out to um, many countries around the world. Um, I wondered if you can give us an overview of your, of your career and of your story um, and obviously up to up to the time when you decided to write this book. Mm, sure, sure, Rob. Uh, so I'm a mining engineer, uh, started in the industry just over 30 years ago. I have only spent my time in open cut. Uh, I've never been underground, be it, uh, be it good or bad, it's just open cut. And I uh, have worked in both coal and iron ore. All of my experience has been in Australia. Uh, I've, I've worked in a number of different states in Australia, but it's all been around Australia. I started uh, my career working for Rio Tinto. Uh, spent um, probably about six or seven years with Rio Tinto. Uh, worked through the, the standard sort of uh, mining engineering roles of drill and blast and design, drag line engineer and scheduling and so on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before heading over to the iron ore in Western Australia. Um, and working as grade control superintendent and production superintendent. Then I left Rio and joined a major contractor in Australia called Tease Contractors and started a, a new mine for them called Burton Coal Mine as the tech services manager, built my own team, started the mine from scratch. Uh, I can't tell you how much of a relief it was when we found the coal exactly where it was supposed to be uh, and we hadn't dug this giant hole for nothing. Um, so I spent about four years or so there. Then I decided it was time to, uh, for a change and to go out into business for myself. So I started my own mining consultancy back in 1999 as a one-man band working out of home. I grew that to about 30 consultants or so with offices in two offices in uh, Queensland. Uh, before deciding in 2012 that uh, I, uh, it was time for a change again uh, and so that I would sell my mining consultancy business. So I sold that consultancy business and uh, was a little bit um, over the mining industry at the time. So spent a while deciding what I would do, uh, decided I would leave the industry and went off and bought a locksmith business. So I still have that locksmith business today. Uh, it really but after about three, three or four years spent contemplating, should I let that 25 years of mining knowledge disappear off into the ether, uh, never to be seen again, I decided that that probably wasn't clever in the scheme of things and that, that I should just continue and, and keep that knowledge that, that I've built up over that time. So that's three or four years back. I just started consulting again, um, just on an ad hoc basis. And uh, so that has sort of uh, has brought me to where I am today, where I still have my locksmith business and I just do some consulting, et cetera, uh, in the mining industry. Great. Um, so obviously you came back into the industry. Um, I suppose what, what made you, first of all, what made you leave the industry to then come back in? Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, you had a lock, locksmith business. What was, the, um, yeah. what was your reasoning behind that? I think, the, I think the leave in the industry was, I just got a, I, I'd had a, uh, like I say, my, my, my own consulting business for about 12 years or so. I'd become a little bit disillusioned. Um, I'd become a little bit disillusioned with, uh, making suggestions and proposing ideas to mine sites that I thought were a no-brainer in the scheme of things, uh, risk-free for them, 
you know, for example, teams around reducing coal losses and those sorts of things. Um, and, I, and I think for me, you know, one of my perceptions of the mining industry is that when, it, when, when commodity prices are up, they make good money and they make very good money. Um, and so they're not interested, to, for some reason or other, they're almost not interested in making more money to some extent. It's like, uh, let's not break this. It's, you know, the status quo, let's just sort of hum along fine. Then commodity prices go through the floor in the, in the typical cycle that they always do. And then it just becomes this massive knee-jerk reaction where they just cut expenses everywhere. And, uh, and in fact, they cut things that are entirely logical and so on in the scheme of things. Um, and I just was a little bit over sort of that, uh, that cycle and that, that knee-jerk reaction. Um, yet, you know, um, me suggesting to numerous minds numerous times um, long-term improvements that they could make sort of that, that I was just like hitting my head against the brick wall. So what, what inspired you to obviously write, write this book? When I, uh, when I started uh, consulting back in about four or five years back, I, I was just doing the odd consulting task and so on. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I've always thought about mind planning was that I've always thought uh, mind planning was a bit of a broken model uh, in the scheme of things. We either, you know, we churn out mind plans on this all too frequent basis. Uh, we tie up uh, ludicrous amounts of mining engineering labor time, sort of churning out these mine plans that are wrong. Um, and uh, I've always thought uh, that there's something wrong with this model and it needs fixing. And I guess it was a couple of years back, I sort of came to this point where it's like, uh, I'm over, I'm over the, uh, the definition of insanity that we continue to meet in the mining industry where we just keep doing the same thing and we expect, expect a different result. Uh, and I came to this point where it's like, I've spent you know, 30 years working in the, in the industry. Uh, I would now like to work what I call on the industry instead. Uh, mine planning is a bit of a passion of mine. So I sort of figured why not take mine planning? And, uh, and I, um, I unashamedly uh, borrowed um, a legacy from a book that I read called Legacy, which is all about the All Blacks. Um, and so the, I decided on a legacy at the time of leaving mine planning in a better place than I found it 30 years ago, which I'm not convinced that it is at the moment, is, is in a better place than it was 30 years ago. When I think about the customers being the production team and so you know, handing our customers a mine plan for them to go and implement, I don't think that uh, what we're providing them as a product is necessarily any better than it was 30 years ago. And so, so I decided I wanted to do something about mine planning. And then it was, then it was a matter of what. Uh, and I've got a business friend who coaches accountants and he's written four books. And he, he was sort of been at me for a long time to, uh, to write a book. Uh, and he said, you know, if you want to make a difference, writing a book is a really good way to make a difference. Now, I'm an engineer. I, I hate writing at the best of times. Just give me an Excel spreadsheet sort of any time. And so the, the concept of writing a book was not one that I was going to easily and rapidly take on. But I just sort of came to this point where it's like, I think he's right. I think I've got to write a book. And so the, that, that was sort of the inspiration was, uh, was okay, um, just sit down and just do this, you know, make, make it a priority in the scheme of things. And so, so that was the sort of uh, the reasoning behind the book. And then it was a case of, well, what am I going to write about? Because I could have written about any number of subjects. Uh, and I think it's my personality, but I like to challenge paradigms. And there are lots of paradigms in the uh, mining industry. And uh, I really just wanted to challenge some of those and, and give people something to think about uh, and maybe, you know, hopefully sort of uh, facilitate tackling things a different way sort of uh, in the mine planning space. Um, obviously, the book may be controversial and maybe uh, obviously um, a lot of arguments for and to, et cetera. Um, yes. But what, what, what do you hope to achieve in obviously writing this book on mine planning um, and I suppose, what do you think of the outcomes or what do you expect the outcomes to be? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, when I, when I thought about writing the book, uh, I really sort of had two primary reasons for writing the book. Uh, one, I just, I, I just wanted to challenge 
some things in the industry that uh, I think a couple of things, you know, because uh, mind planning, mind planning has stakeholders at sort of all levels in the organization. You know, it's the one thing that's produced by a mining engineer on site that heads all the way up to the executive level. Whereas you go and produce a pit design or a drag line design or a drill and blast design or something like that, that doesn't go very far at all. That goes, that goes to the production team to execute and that's about it. But the mine plan is the one thing that sort of heads a long way up the ladder. And so, so it does have a lot of stakeholders in the scheme of things. And, and I, I often wonder what percentage of those stakeholders actually have a good understanding of mine planning and know sort of what's gone into them and the, the assumptions and all those sorts of things. So, so I figured that writing a book on mine planning was, was, was a good way to just get a, a bit more general knowledge out there about mine planning in general. And, and, you know, one of the things in writing the book was that I hoped that it wasn't just read by mine planners and that was it. You know, the book is not written just for mine planners. It's really written for uh, various levels in the organisation and various sort of stakeholders, uh, you know, the, the accounting space, the, the finance space who, who take mine plans and turn them into budgets and so on, uh, geologists, surveyors, uh, you know, the, the management at, at mines and the executive levels above and so on. The book, the book was actually sort of written for anyone who, who has anything to do with sort of mine planning or as a customer of it sort of. And so I really wanted to write something that uh, raised some issues, uh, got people thinking uh, about mine planning and uh, maybe got them to sort of uh, ask, ask questions. And so, on. so that was that was really sort of my first objective. Uh, second, second objective was to hopefully give myself, Mark Bowood, some more credibility and, and give, give my voice a bit more weight in the scheme of things. You know, with long-term objective that if I'm talking about uh, things that I think that should change in the mine planning space, that, that hopefully my voice carries a bit more weight. You know, there, there are things like sort of optimistic planning inputs and so on that have just been around forever and, and, and aren't changing. And, uh, and so when I talk about the mine plans and that sort of stuff, uh, I'm sort of hoping that people might sit up and listen a bit more having written a book. So, so there were sort of the two primary reasons behind writing the book and, and, and I guess what I hope to achieve out of it. Um, obviously, the book is called Crimes Against Mind Planning. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about some of these crimes that you obviously believe in. Um, that, that is obviously hence the reason why you wrote the book. Yeah. It's uh, Crimes Against Mind Planning, the, the, the top 10 sort of pitfalls. And so I chose 10 crimes that, uh, and, and I'm very open at the it, sort of the end of the book that, you know, my experience is open cut in Australia. So these are the sort of top 10 crimes as I've seen them from Australian perspective and from an open cut perspective. I certainly haven't spoken with numerous people since I put the book out who are underground and numerous people from around the world it does seem that um, they, there is some commonality uh, across the industry sort of so that that's good you know um, but yeah I chose 10 uh, and it's funny because even uh, after having chosen 10 and, and written about them and and you know, then lots of people come back with lots of comments on, oh, surely, uh, you know, this makes you top 10 sort of and so on. And there's a few of them that I've read and I've gone, oh, yeah, that's really good crime. That that actually probably should have been in my top 10. Um, so, so I already, uh, you know, if, if I was writing a sequel and I was writing the, the next 10, 11 to 20, sort of, I, I guess I already have half of them sort of. Not, not that I'm necessarily intending to uh, write a sequel because, uh, as I said earlier, I'm not really a fan of writing books. Uh, but, but for me, uh, there were two standouts when I really sat down and thought about it. There were two sort of crimes that I think sit head and shoulders above the rest. Uh, and they are, the first one is what I, what I call our sort of our unyielding faith and belief in deterministic planning. And, and deterministic planning is where you just choose a single sort of assumption for equipment production, calendars and those sorts of things. And so you create a plan a mine plan where you have single point assumptions for all of the equipment and how long it's going to take to do every task. 
And uh, so you put out a plan that says, this is where we are now. And in a month's time, this is where all of the pieces of equipment are going to be. And the mining industry has this unyielding faith that, that that's 100% right and that we should be able to do it. And they hold people accountable to it. You know, one of the measures is compliance to plan uh, and mine sites target 100% compliance to plan. And so they expect the production team to be exactly sort of at that point in a month's time, you know. Now that's ridiculous in the scheme of things because the amount of variability that you have in the mine industry from weather through to breakdowns through to, you know, poor blasts that dig slow to any number of things. We have an extreme amount of variability in mining processes. And in a deterministic plan, we don't take account of that variability in any way, shape or form. Um, but that variability is what kills our mine planning to some extent, because it means that at some point in time, the, the mine plan gets out, it, it gets wrong, and it just gets too far wrong from what's actually happening out in the pits. And therefore, you have to go and sort of reschedule again, sort of. So, you know, so the solution to that is, is stochastic or probabilistic planning instead, where you actually apply variabilities and you put ranges around things. And instead of talking in terms of, well, we're going to finish dig digging that blast in eight days' time, you sort of instead talk about the fact that, well, we'll uh, our expected time to finish that is about eight days, but it could be anywhere between six and 16. And so we need to take that into consideration in terms of equipment that's available to dig that and where we go to from there and in terms of all of the sequencing that, that occurs in mine planning. So, so for me, the, you know, certainly that's one of the biggest crimes is, is that with the IT capabilities and the tools, et cetera, that we have these days, I still just can't believe that we, our scheduling tools are all deterministic planning. They're not probabilistic and that there's no mainstream tool that I've been able to find out there that allows us to introduce variability into our mind planning. I, th I think that's, you know, we're still like out of the seventies from sort of, you know, last century you know, in, in the scheme of mind planning. So, so for me, that's, that's, that's probably one of the biggest crimes. I think the other crime that sort of stands head and shoulders above the rest is, is just the, the crime of, optimistic input assumptions into our mine plans. We take mine plans and we use them as a motivator. We use them to drive performance improvements and so on. And, you know, no one, we can't be putting out a plan that says that we're just going to continue to do what we've always done. Our plans have got to show improvement. And so therefore they are performance drivers. Uh, but as soon as we, as soon as we introduce optimistic planning assumptions into our plans, then we shorten what I call the shelf life of the plan, the, the, the length of time that the plan is actually useful before it becomes too far out and, and it just becomes useless and you have to redo a new one. And so as soon as we you know, introduce optimistic, optimistic assumptions, we shorten the shelf life, we make the plan a bit of a joke in the, at the mine site, production team, the production team think mine plans are a waste of time. Mine planners don't know what they're talking about. You know, mine planners themselves become sort of, uh, you know, unmotivated. Uh, and there's this real culture uh, that seeps into the mine site that mine plans are a waste of time. And, you know, we've got to follow them, but, but these planners don't know what they're talking about. And a lot of that is actually driven by uh, the, the urge to put optimistic assumptions in in the first place that aren't the mind, my, by the mind planner's choice. The mind planner will always sort of choose to create a mind plan that they think matches reality. Uh, but the trouble is, is that when, when a mind planner creates a mind plan that matches reality, that's not a good enough that's not a good enough plan and that doesn't you know, drive performance change and all those sorts of things. And so mine planners invariably get told to use a more optimistic set of assumptions than that. And, uh, and for me, the, the downfalls sort of outweigh um, the benefits of that. You know, I, I think that there's actually a need to separate the, the um, performance motivation part uh, and instead put that into the benchmarking space. And so, you know, create a benchmarking system and process 
at your mind site and then separate that from the mind planning part sort of so so for me they're the, the two greatest crimes I, I cover other crimes such as we have kpis for everything in the mining industry and we have these kpis that we think are for mine plans such as compliance to plan but that's actually not a measure of how good the plan is that's just a measure of how well you can follow the plan we have a shortage of KPIs that measure what is the quality of our mine planning. Is it improving over time? You know, how does it change as we sort of change one mine planner in and another one out? You know, did, did that suddenly create a step change in our mine planning and, and so on sort of. So we have a lack of KPIs that measure the quality of mine plans. We don't really know how to execute mine plans. We sort of focus on the wrong things within the tar within the plan itself. Uh, and uh, and about sort of five others sort of so I, I could talk all day about the crimes crimes against me. I was going to ask you why um, how come you chose that title? Well, it was yeah, because, because obviously it can, obviously it can be controversial, and is that yeah. and I suppose is that the reason why you chose that title because it can be controversial, and I suppose it makes make people look at the book. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting because, you know, when I was thinking about a title, I sort of thought, well, I want something a bit catchy and so on. And it's interesting because I've watched so much repetition of these issues in mind planning for so long that to me now, I automatically just think of them as crimes. I think that some of the things that happen are criminal, you know, uh, they're, they're not criminal in a legislative sense, but, but I still just think that they're criminal and that they are, they are doing an injustice to the mining industry. You know, the amount of money that we waste globally would, would just be unfathomable in the scheme of things sort of. And so, so I do actually think of them as crimes. And so, uh, you know, then it was a matter of sort of uh, um, uh, putting crimes in the title sort of somewhere and so on. Um, and when I came up with the title, I actually, yeah, I liked it. I thought to myself, that's really good. And uh, I, I've had sort of feedback from a lot of people. You know, one of the first things a lot of people say is love the title. That's great. Uh, and it certainly does, uh, has helped to attract attention. And, and, you know, controversy for me, it's like, uh, I'm sort of fairly firm on the positions that I've taken in terms of the crimes and, and the things that we do wrong in the industry. Uh, and I'm open for discussion on them, but, um, but I, I just, I really just wanted to raise the issues and start the discussion. If, if the one thing that came out of this book was discussion, uh, and in particular, sort of throughout the industry, because I, I find the mining industry suffers a lot from the silo effect where, you know, you have all these, uh, all these individual mines and, and even within your big miners, such as your Rio Tintos and your BHPs and so on, um, they still don't necessarily talk to each other a lot. And, uh, and they're all sort of doing the same thing and, and, uh, and making the same mistakes. And, and, and so I really, if the one thing that I could do was facilitate some discussion across the industry as to, well, you know, what should we do differently, then, then, then I'll be happy in the scheme of things. Um, how, when did you actually release the book and sort of what response have you had so far? Mid-January, I released it and, uh, and, and the, the PDF version is free. Uh, and I must admit, I sort of spent a lot of time thinking about that. But for me, it was, I really, I, I didn't do it to make money out of being an author. Um, uh, that's an extremely difficult way to make money for someone such as me who hates writing sort of. So it was never about making money. Um, and it really was about getting the book out there. And so I think that, I think that my um, tactic of the PDF being free has really helped in the scheme of things because I've distributed uh, over 2,000 copies sort of in just over a month uh, and still um, 20 to 30 people a day sort of asking for it and so on. So, so the, the response has been awesome, um, you know, because uh, it took me 14 months to write the book. Uh, and I spent a lot of that time trying to talk myself out of writing the book and finding distractions. It was very easy to find a distraction to stop writing. And um, so, so the one thing that I sort of kept thinking to myself was imagine getting the book and putting this book out there and it's just like crickets, you know, it's uh, silent. So that would be devastating sort of. So, so I was, it was a, a great relief um, when there was interest in the book. 
And I did, I, I guess I did think that there was going to be some interest and some, some sort of latent demand because I started writing articles on LinkedIn uh, around my scheduling probably about 10 to 12 months ago. And, uh, and there's been a really good sort of take up in those articles. You know, uh, there's a couple of them that sort of have had over 3,000 reads and, and, uh, and I get a lot of feedback and so on. Sort of, I've had a lot of feedback about my articles. So, so that gave me some confidence that uh, putting a book out might have some sort of success behind it. Uh, but then you get the question, it's, it's, it's interesting because when you, when you write a book and you put it out there, you sort of think to yourself, maybe it's boring. You know, maybe it's just going to put people to sleep, right? It is mind planning. It is a really dry subject in the scheme of things. You know, how can you make mind planning exciting? And I'm not necessarily the guy to make mind planning exciting. So, so you know, I was sort of just a bit worried about, well, I think there'll be some interest, but, but can I write a good book? Can I write a book that people find interesting, you know? Uh, and I think, that, I think that one of the things that I've learned out of the feedback that I've got is that I think that I'm good at taking the complex and via real life stories or or examples, turning it into simple, simple that everyone you know can understand sort of. So so I think that's one of the one of the good feedback that I've got is from people is that it's easy to understand, it's interesting, they like the use of the real life stories and and so on. So so yeah, so I'm I'm sort of happy with 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 the response so far. Yeah, obviously, with all the positive feedback that you have received, has anyone come to see, come to you to say, "Look, we have implemented something that you've suggested, and and it works." Not yet, but that's the day I'm hoping for to some extent. So I've had there's been lots of people so far who like, "Wow, you've got me thinking. I, I need to go off and think about this." Uh, you know, there's been a few people who have come back so far. So, for example, take the optimistic, you know, uh, input assumptions. Uh, there was a guy who came back the other day, wrote me a fairly long message to say, yeah, he agrees. And that's something that, a few, you know, three to six months back, they realised was, was an issue. And so, you know, they've started a process of using historical mean values and only using improvements on those if there's a recognized change implementation process sort of in place and so on. So sort of like sort of heading down that journey. So, so yeah, there's been there's been lots of feedback so far in terms of okay, uh, we've got some things that we need to think about. Um, too early yet for anyone to come back with any successes. So, and and, and uh, you know, I suppose the other thing that I've been waiting for too, and I've been wondering how they would handle people who came back and disagreed with something that I wrote. Uh, you know, thought that uh, I'd got it totally wrong sort of and so on. Uh, hasn't been any of those yet. And that, that doesn't mean that, that, uh, that, that they, they don't disagree with me. I think it just means that they haven't bothered to write to me sort of, you know, and so, so the, the ones who have bothered to write to me are the, uh, are the advocates and the fans sort of, but I'm sure, I, I'm sure that there'll be a lot of people out there who, who disagree with what I've written sort of and so on. And, and for me, it's like, I actually don't mind that. Like I say, if, if I can just facil facilitate some discussion, you know, and get the ball rolling on change, then, then I, I feel that's been a success. Yeah, so lastly, what's what's the uh, rest of the year and next year looking like for Mark then? Yeah, yeah, good question. And it's something that uh, I guess you know, once I put the book out and, and uh, there was a lot of interest in it, uh, it sort of got me thinking because for me it was like, well, that's the first step in the journey, you know, uh, 12, 14 months back I decided, all right, I'm going to write a book and that's all I, all I worried about. I didn't worry about anything else. Uh, put the book out now. It's been successful. And so for me, it's like uh, I want to, I, I'm still driven by that uh, leaving mind planning in a better place than I found it. And so, you know, for me now, I'm thinking about, well, what's the next step now that I can continue to reinforce all this work that I've done? You know, and there's, a, there's, there's lots of things that I'm sort of thinking about. I mean, you know, one of the first things that sort of came to mind was, well, maybe I should write another book. Um, you know, maybe I should write a mind planning 101, right? This is how you do mind planning that it becomes sort of a, a textbook in universities and any mind site when a mind planner starts, you know, they get given this book like it's the Bible and it's like, here, you know, take this and, and do that. You know, and I think to myself, 
well, if you could get that sort of globally and so on, then you, you're probably making an impact on on my planet, you know. Um, but the concept of writing another book is, is not grabbing me. I think it's way it's, it's way way too early. I'm not I'm not ready for the pain yet, sort of. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, I've, I've been thinking about mentoring engineers. So I've actually launched a program recently to, to mentor mining engineers, you know, again, uh, I sort of think to myself, gee, if I could, gen if I could mentor a generation of mining engineers, that, that, you know, I think that hopefully would make an impact and uh, create some change. Uh, software, I've, I've got a guy sort of creating a little software tool for me at the moment about that change from, deterministic planning to probabilistic mind planning just to sort of get people thinking about variability and so on. So I've got sort of a few little things I'm trying. Uh, uh, I don't really know exactly which one it is I'm going to pick up and, and run with yet or, you know, or what else, whether it might be something completely different. But, but certainly for me, 2022 is about just trying to leverage, you know, the, the fact that there are people interested in the book and, and that I have made some impact and how can I continue that in terms of, you know, ultimately getting to my legacy of leaving my plan in a better place than I found it. Obviously, you mentioned about a second book, but obviously before you started this whole process, obviously you had some reservations. Now you've gone through the whole process. Now looking back, do you, do you feel that it was worthwhile? And did you get the enjoyment and satisfaction from writing, writing a book and now, I suppose, getting the feedback from people in industry um, that, that has obviously read the book? How, how do you feel now looking back? Yeah, I think, I think that the first thing I think to myself is uh, if, if I had known the, um, the level of interest and the impact, et cetera, I would have written a book a long time ago. Uh, so 100% uh, of the time, if I could, 100% you know, if I could go back in time, I would do exactly the same thing. Um, and the the thing that it was interesting that the thing that I found interesting, really interesting about writing the book was it forced me to sort of think at a, at a bit of a deeper level. Sort of, you know, I've always been one for questioning why and challenging paradigms, and I've I've always thought that there's some things that we should do differently in mind planning. But in having to sort of sit down and write a whole chapter about one particular subject or, or whatever, it, you, you've really got to think about it a lot and you've really got to build a fair bit of content. Uh, and I actually found the process really useful in terms of just forcing me to think about things deeper than I, than I ever had before. And I, and I actually always thought that I had done a lot of thinking about my plan, sort of. So, so it really did force me to to reflect on a lot of things it, it actually led to me changing my mind about a number of things so for example if I think about my plans from long term through to short term and, and that you cascade down and you should start with a long term plan first and then that drives all the shorter term plans sort of you know beneath it uh, when I sat down and thought about it I actually changed my mind and, and I, I came up with a different approach there whereas I'd been into cascading plans for sort of 25 years beforehand sort of so so the book was the book was really good was really Really good for that uh, I think that like I say that the take up uh, I've been um, I've been very happy at at, uh, at the level of take up uh, I think probably what I'm waiting for now is that uh, you know that I don't know there's maybe two or three hundred people out there who have read it there's probably 1500 people who are you know on chapter three or something I think I'm waiting for a good sample size of people to actually finish the whole the book as a whole, uh, and then see what comes back from from those people. I think I think that's what I really sort of want to see next. So, but yeah, look, undoubtedly, uh, not that I enjoyed the experience, but it was a great experience, and uh, and I should have done it a long time ago. Mark, really appreciate your time um, in, in obviously doing this podcast and obviously producing the book as well. Um, and this is this is the whole thing about me doing doing these podcasts because I want to educate the mining industry. And you've you've just shown there that you've you've taken the time out to produce a book to educate people within the industry and that are involved in mine planning. Um, so I really appreciate your time coming on and sharing your experiences. Um, and for those that are listening, if they want to sort of download a copy or even buy a copy 
um, because mm -hmm. I think it, obviously it must be useful for not just mm -hmm. mine planners, but for anyone involved in the, I suppose, an operation, uh, a, mine, a mine operation. How can they go about doing that? And also if they want to reach out to you, if they've got any questions, um, how can yeah. they go about doing that? Uh, yeah, so I have a website, uh, www.markbowwater.com. Uh, the book's on there. So the, the, the free PDF is on there. You can download the free PDF. I also have printed versions on there. The printed versions that are on my website are actually just for Australia because of the cost of international shipping. So I've also set up uh, on, in three different formats of the, the book is on Amazon. So if people search crimes against mine planning, then um, they'll find it on, on Amazon. And LinkedIn, uh, basically LinkedIn is my main platform for communication. I post regularly. Uh, as I say, I've written about 22 articles regarding sort of mine planning. And um, so, you know, people, uh, if, if, if they download the book and they like it, feel free to go and sort of read some of my articles. And uh, certainly LinkedIn is, is an easy method to communicate, is to contact me if anyone wants to ask any questions or anything, or you know, on my website, there's a contact form as well. Yeah, that's great. And I'm sure our audience will, uh, will uh, take advantage of that. Um, and yeah, for those that are obviously listening, um, this, is, this is definitely uh, an episode that is educational. And I do appreciate if you can share this amongst obviously people within the industry uh, and obviously they don't need to be mine planners they can be anyone that's involved obviously in the in um in mine production so i'm sure they're going to get some something from it so i appreciate if you can uh, obviously share this episode uh with obviously people within the industry um all with all four corners of the world so um help promote obviously mark's mark's work um and obviously the podcast so again appreciate your continued support Appreciate your time, Mark. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. It was a uh, it was a good chat. Uh, I'm always happy to talk about mind planning anytime. So uh, so I apologise if I uh, went off on various tangents or delved into way too much detail. I could talk about mind planning forever, but it, but it was good. I, I enjoyed it. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, no worries. And until next time, happy mining.